Hello. On behalf of the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable and the Western Sustainability and Pollution Prevention Network, we welcome you and thank you for joining this webinar as part of, part of the Spring Safer Chemistry Challenge Program webinar series. My name is Donna Walden from WISPIN and I will be your moderator today. The goal of NPPR Safer Chemistry Challenge Program is to motivate, challenge, assist, and reward companies as you find safer alternatives to chemicals of concern to human health and the environment. As a unique partnership between industry, states, and nonprofits, this challenge program can help you accelerate opportunities to expand your customer base and capture emerging markets for products with safer chemistries, turn your commitment to safer chemistry into an action plan, increase workforce safety, and ensure the health of consumers, achieve cost savings with a better understanding of the ever-changing chemical regulatory landscape, and utilizes, utilize resources such as technical assistance programs, webinars, and recognition programs. Before we begin, there are just a few logistics to cover. During the webinar, all attendees will be on mute. If you have questions, please submit them anytime throughout the webinar through the submit questions option in the chat window that GoToWebinar provides. Kim Richards from NPPR will relay the questions at the end of the webinar when the Q&A period begins. We would like very much to hear from you about how this webinar helps meet your company's program needs to move forward safer chemistries. For that reason, at the end of the webinar, you'll receive a short survey, so please be sure to provide NPPR with some feedback. In addition, if you would like a copy of the presentations, they will be available for download at the NPPR website about a week after the webinar. So, Today, we have the long-anticipated webinar called California Priority Products List. Under the California Safer Consumer Products Reg Regulations, California is carrying out a process of identifying chemicals of concern in products, requiring the evaluation of safer alternatives, and implementing regulations that promote reducing exposures to hazardous chemical product combinations. The Safer Consumer Product Regulations established a two-phase alternatives analysis process that requires that manufacturers guide companies through steps to evaluate alternatives. The overall goal is safer alternatives and no regrettable substitutions. The California Department of Toxic Substances Control recently released its first three products under the Safer Consumer Product Regulations, which our presenter, Carl Palmer, will discuss today. So we are very, very delighted to have Carl Palmer here. Carl works for the Department of Toxic Substances Controls Safer Products and Workplaces Program, where he is responsible for DTSC's efforts to implement the department's safer consumer product regulations. These regulations establish a process to identify and prioritize hazardous chemicals in consumer products and to establish a process for evaluating options for safer alternatives. Carl's team also administers DTSC's other toxics in products laws and helps lead the department's efforts to expand P2 practices, green chemistry st uh, strategies, and sustainability initiatives throughout California. So without further ado, we are going to give the controls to Carl. Okay, um, let me pull up this first slide and put it in the right mode. Okay, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Donna, for that uh, nice in introduction. I want to thank uh, Donna Walden of WISPEN and Kim Richards of the Roundtable for hosting this uh, webinar and giving me the opportunity to talk to you all about what we're doing here in California. Um, so today, I'm going to um, give you sort of a whirlwind tour um, of some of the things we're doing to implement our new safer consumer products regulations. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our approach and the, the kind of the overall concept of how the regs are structured and the framework, if you will. I'm going to talk specifically about the, the first set of what we call priority products that we're proposing we uh, put out there um, to go through this process. 
I'll talk in detail about um, all our framework for alternatives analysis, or as many people call alternative assessment, um, and then a little bit about uh, the options that we have in deciding how we uh, respond to those, those analyses and, and our regulatory responses, and then hopefully give you some sense of how this will roll out um, in the future. So what, what's the base, basic thing we're trying to do here? Well, um, as most of you are aware, most environmental regulatory uh, agencies um, have a relatively um, narrow focus on one media or another, and many of our frameworks have been in the construct of either establishing some kind of threshold or permitting process or um, ban, if you will, or, or some very specific uh, response to a problem. And our mission is, is uh, by definition, relatively broad. What we're trying to do is address a, a myriad of potential adverse impacts that result from toxic chemicals in consumer products. And we're doing that not by um, either banning a specific product or setting a specific, specific regulatory threshold, but rather um, asking people who make these products to analyze them and see if there's a, a safer, better way to make them. Um, and one of the key concepts we're trying to do um, in this framework is avoid regrettable substitutions. We've had many efforts in the past where we've um, banned something or restricted something only to um, find that we've pushed people to using a different chemical uh, that might have similar or worse properties that result in harm. So we're trying to avoid that in general. And the goal, obviously, is uh, to have safer products and to have um, uh, you know, everyone uh, be healthier and have our envir environment be clean and safe, um, as well as to provide uh, a framework that supports the market and the strength of the market and our ingenuity uh, and the great resource of engineers and scientists we have making our products today. So to give you a little snapshot of where we've come from and our, our, what we like to call, um, apologies to Paul McCartney, the long and winding road of California's approach, we started uh, in 2007 looking at um, how we might incorporate green chemistry principles uh, into a variety of aspects of what we're doing in California, both in terms of the regulatory framework, in terms of promoting in our education system, green chemistry thinking, in terms of developing markets and job opportunities for uh, new technologies, et cetera. Um, we moved along, and then in 2008, the California legislature passed um, a law that required that we the TSC uh, draft regulations to try to tackle a new framework for how we might make consumer products safer. And that's taken quite a while. So I'm happy to say that uh, at the end of 2013, our new safer consumer products regulations were uh, in place and effective, and that's what we're on embarking on implementing now. So we've, uh, our current director, Debbie Raffel, is in the picture on the upper right, and we've had a couple other directors, and two and a half governors since then, uh, so we're well on our way. So one of the, the framework um, narratives we have is, is rather than saying, you know, we're going to tell you what to do and this is the, how we want you to do it, we're turning this around and asking people who design and make products to say, um, we're saying, is it necessary that you use this particular chemical that has certain hazard traits? Is there a safer alternative? Can you use a different chemical? Can you design your product in a way where the in intrinsic hazards of that chemical don't become risks uh, to the people that use those products, to our environment, where they might ultimately end up at end of life? So that's the basic question. And how are we implementing that? That's what I'm going to talk about. So our regulations are essentially in four big parts. And what we did was first um, we embarked on setting a framework that identifies chemicals uh, that we call candidate chemicals, um, which it have certain hazard traits of concern. Um, then we're moving on and identifying specific products that contain one or more of those chemicals. Uh, um, and those are the ones we just recently announced our first round of what we call priority products. The next steps in the regulations require that the people that make those products conduct what we would call an alternatives analysis. And the, the basic goal there is to um, find if there are safer alternatives and inform decision making about 
uh, where to go from there. Can we make it safer? Ultimately, a key part of this is that um, our role as regulator is to look at that alternatives analysis that the manufacturer conducts and say, great, is it, did, did you come up with a safer, better way to make it, or do we need to take some kind of regulatory action to um, either um, require something else be done or um, some restriction on that product be made, and I'll talk about that in more detail. So there's really a four-part uh, framework here that we're working with. So the first part, candidate, candidate chemicals identification, uh, I wanted to give you our construct. What we did was essentially develop a list of lists um, where we looked outward and, and throughout the world we identified uh, 23 different lists that were developed by different authoritative bodies uh, for different purposes, but they were um, basically in two categories of types of lists. Hazard trait lists, lists that focus on a specific chemical and a specific hazard trait, whether it's a carcinogen, a reproductive toxicant, um, a respiratory sensitizer, et cetera. And then another kind of list, which is really focused on what we call exposure indicators. Are, are some of these chemicals in our environment? Are they in water or, or are they in our air? Or do we know that they're in people uh, through biomonitoring? And so collectively, those 23 lists comprise the menu, if you will, of what we call candidate chemicals. If you look in the center of this graphic, between what we call the, the blueberries on the left and the grapes on the right, um, for the first round of priority product selection, we chose to narrow our focus somewhat in terms of the menu of chemicals by saying that we would pick only chemicals which are on one, are, are each on a hazard trait list and an exposure list. So of the approximately 1,100 chemicals in our broad candidate chemical list of those 23 lists, we narrowed that down to about 150 or so that were on one of each of those lists. And that's where we started for our first um, selection. Now, in September, we um, put up this uh, list and we provided on our webpage um, uh, a searchable candidate chemical database, which looks at all the chemicals on those lists. And this is an informative list which we hope allows a variety of people to look and see what's there and why. Uh, and so you can go in there and you can type in a chemical or a, a CAS number and you can see, for example, you know, what are the specific hazard traits um, that brought that chemical into our view and where did it come from? Which list that, you know, of the 23 was it on? Additionally, you can search, you can, you know, bore down in this and you can get more specific information on a specific chemical. Um, so for example, on this slide you can see um, that this chemical uh, came from, it's on a Prop 65 list here in California um, and it's also on 303D list, a 303C list. Um, and so that gives you some more information about um, the chemicals that, are, that we're looking at. Uh, it's our hope that those lists, um, that people will be looking at those lists now, even if they aren't, haven't been named as a priority product, but looking at the things that we feel um, you might consider as, in your product design. If you have one of those chemicals in your product, maybe you start thinking about uh, using a, a, a safer chemical. So um, after we've got the menu of chemicals, then what? Well, then we need to go forward and decide that um, which one of these are we going to be looking at in a specific uh, consumer product. And so what were the criteria for making those selections? In our regulations, uh, the key principles that we utilize in picking our, our priority products are, are two main things. One, looking at a product that contains that candidate chemical and that you could be potentially be exposed to. And then do we have information that shows that there's potential for that exposure to cause um, some kind of significant or widespread adverse harm, either to people or to the environment. And those are very broad categories. Within that um, basic exposure model, if you will, uh, we had other factors to consider. One of the key ones was, are there affected sensitive subpopulations? And we consider sensitive subpopulations, things like women um, of childbearing age, uh, children, uh, endangered species, uh, threatened environments, and we also consider workers as a sensitive subpopulation based on their uh, long-term exposure potentially in the workplace to uh, these products. So 
none of these factors are heavily weighted over one or the other, so we have a lot of latitude to pick ones that we think are significant uh, and put those forward, and that's what we're doing in our first round of priority products. Um, so, again, why did we pick the ones we picked? Well, I'm going to go through each of the first uh, products we picked and explain to you our thinking someone on there and some background. And let me just say that um, it's important to note that the products, the products we've selected, we are not um, saying that we think these are the worst uh, products out there, that these are the best candidates, that, um, that they're the most hazardous chemical. We've been careful in the construction of our regulations to uh, ensure we weren't trying to get uh, at the top of the list. We were trying to find things that are significant and we think are good candidates because we feel that if we were trying to get the most, the worst, the best, et cetera, um, that's a slippery slope that um, there are a lot of uh, factors that, that might go into that discussion. So we're picking what we hope are good ones. So what are they? We've picked three products to, uh, in launching um, this part of the, our implementation effort. Uh, the first one is called Children's Foam Padded Sleep Products with the flame retardant PDCPP, or chlorinated tris. Second uh, priority product is paint strippers and surface cleaners with methylene chloride. And the third uh, priority product is spray polyurethane foam systems with unreacted diesocyanates. And I'm going to go through each one of these. So first, the children's uh, foam padded sleeping products. Um, what does that mean? There, you know, one of the things I want to note is that um, traditionally our agency and many of the like ours um, have uh, spent a lot of time doing pollution prevention, certainly uh, working in various sectors, but predominantly looking at you know, site cleanups in the Superfund program, our hazardous waste permitting program, looking at processes like that, and not particularly in the product world. So this is a new area for us, and um, we're in the process of uh, uh, trying to figure out how best to communicate uh, in a regulatory manner, uh, what we're talking about. So words are important. So what are these products? Um, they are products like nap mats, uh, travel beds, portable cribs, and play pens, things like that. Um, they all contain the foam that's been treated with TDCPP. And um, so there are a lot of children's products in the market, some that contain foam. Our thinking here is to narrow this down because of the specific hazard traits of the chemical and because of the potential exposure um, and potential impact from that exposure. So specifically, we know TDCPP is a carcinogen. We know it has uh, properties that make it an endocrine disruptor. And we know that the nature of these products is that um, children spend a lot of time uh, sleeping in close contact to them and, and thus can uh, absorb uh, TDCPP and inhale dust that it has it as well. So. Another consideration I want to highlight in our selection is looking at uh, the potential alternatives that are already developed or maybe in the pipeline. So when you look at these products from a regulatory standpoint, um, it's not required that they uh, use TDCPP or put a flame retardant in, in them. These are not um, mattresses covered by uh, the Safer Consumer Product Commission. They're not uh, subject to California's uh, uh, provisions on flame retardants. So in some sense, uh, when we ask the question, is it necessary, certainly it's not necessary from a regulatory uh, or legal um, question. And so um, that's the question we're asking the manufacturers of these matches. If you need to use a flame retardant at all, um, can you look at something else? And do you need to use it at all? The second category. Um, I want to highlight is the paint and varnish strippers containing methylene chloride. And uh, this is, uh, relatively speaking, uh, easier to define than certainly the children's products. And many of us have used these uh, in our home, uh, and many businesses use them as well for paint stripping and varnish removal. Uh, the properties of methylene chloride are well known. Um, the um, primary concern that we had is that you, when you're exposed to methylene chloride, it um, metabolizes into carbon monoxide and causes carbon monoxide poison that can lead to death. It's also a carcinogen. Um, products are used widely both uh, in the workplace and in the home. Um, 
and again, consideration of alternatives. While um, they all have different properties and performance characteristics, there are alternatives to using methylene chloride, some better than others probably, depending on which factor you're looking at. Um, and as we uh, highlighted in some of the materials we put out, that some things like um, NMP and methyl, methyl uh, pyrrolidone uh, works, but it has some, some, some not good characteristics as well, so it may be not a substitution that you would consider uh, as being safer. The third category um, I wanted to highlight is spray polyurethane foam systems with unreacted diisocyanates. Now on this one, um, this is interesting because what we're looking at are systems that take an A and B side of this um, polymer and um, when it's not cured, the isocyanates are potentially a problem because um, they have uh, sensitization, um, respiratory sensitizer um, characteristics that are problematic and can cause asthma. Um, again, they're widely used uh, by workers, um, and there are types of spray foams that are used uh, in the home, typically in a, a, a spray bottle that you purchase at a hardware store. Um, and that may have some unreacted uh, diisocyanates in it as well that are of concern. There are alternative um, products that, that provide similar functions like fiberglass and cellulose uh, that are not foam. This one uh, is interesting because we recognize that the basic chemistries to make foam at this point fundamentally require the use of diisocyanates. Um, there is some work being done on alternatives. Those are not viable right now. So this is different um, challenges for um, the manufacturers who are going to be looking at the viability of alternatives. So I want to stop for a second and, and um, discuss what this means. There's, um, it's a complex regulatory framework we put out there with timelines and processes that impact, impact various people. What we've done to date is just put these out as proposed priority products. Um, we are going to collect additional information on the wisdom of those selections. We're going to be holding workshops um, in May and June, um, and we're going to be collecting more information uh, from all the different stakeholders to make sure that we have accurate uh, information and, and knowledge. Then we're going to go into a formal rulemaking process again to adopt each of these products in, in, in regulation. And that means that that's going to take time, uh, and it are in California, uh, our rulemaking process is a very open and transparent process and formal. Uh, so in addition to the workshops we're going to hold, um, before we go into the rulemaking process where we're going to collect information, once we get to rulemaking, we'll be having formal, uh, accepting formal comments and responding and having a hearing and, and going that road. So this is going to take some time. And until such time as we have adopted those priority products, in regulation, there's no regulatory requirement for anyone to do alternatives analysis. There's no restriction on the sale um, of any of these products. Um, we're not there yet. It's going to be a year or plus from today before anyone has to do anything. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to note that these these there was some misinformation about there saying that manufacturers were going to have to notify us that they make these things within 60 days of our announcement. No, those those clocks don't start until sometime after a year from now when we adopt these things in regulation. So one thing is um, some people would like us to move slower, some people would like us to move faster. Uh, this is a new program for us. We're doing um, some new things. So we're trying to um, be prudent and deliberative uh, and transparent as we move forward to get it right. So another uh, question we get is, well, you're only pick three, so what, where to from here? Um, we also have in our regulations a requirement that we develop um, a draft priority products work plan that is on a three-year cycle that will identify which categories of products we're going to be selecting in the next uh, rounds. Um, that is going to be an open process as well. We're going to have workshops this summer on that. But before October, we want to uh, come up with that, that list. Um, and it's not specific priority products necessarily, but categories of priority products so that, one, we can let people know what our thinking is and, and collect good information that will inform us to make good decisions. And at the same time, 
uh, we hope that it will send messages to those uh, sectors that make those categories of products saying, hey, you know, you should be thinking about um, uh, this process as well. Uh, you might be able to get out ahead of, uh, of us and, and look at, at ways to develop better and safer products even before uh, we get them to them in the work plan. Um, so that uh, will continue that process so that um, year after year uh, we'll be looking forward to what's next in the queue. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be selected as a priority product and what the alternatives analysis process entails. So uh, currently there's a lot of different um, frameworks out there uh, for broadly speaking alternative assessment, uh, folks that are looking at uh, a wide array of assessing hazards and risks um, and for various, um, both for developing safer products uh, for or working within another framework or um, getting uh, some endorsement, say, for um, an affirmation of safer products as in US EPA's Design for Environment program. But uh, they're all a little different. Um, and um, so I want to highlight, spend a little bit of time explaining how our, our framework is different from some of these other things. And I'm not going to go into great depth, um, but there's a lot going on. All of these things are developing as we speak. Um, and then what we hope is that in the long run, the community of practice of people who are doing alternatives assessment and alternatives analysis will have a robust, robust set of tools, information methodologies and approaches that will certainly support getting through California's process, but will also be to the extent possible consistent with um, best practices worldwide. So, when the California legislature passed the laws requiring that we go through this process, they specifically identified 13 different criteria of areas that we're supposed to consider as we evaluate alternatives. We call those the A through M criteria because those are the sections in the law. Um, and as you can see, there's a broad, um, somewhat overlapping array of factors here, everything from what we would consider traditional human health and environmental health issues like water, uh, impacts on water and air, um, but going also into greenhouse gas, looking at energy production, um, and looking at the, the useful life, the end of life consequences uh, of a product, economic impacts, and you know the whole life cycle, including extraction, uh, production, transportation, et cetera. So this is an incredibly broad array of factors that need to be considered when someone does an alternatives analysis under our regulations. Now. Don't be intimidated by this table, but I, I do this just to show that those frameworks that I identified earlier all um, are similar but different. And so those A through M criteria are listed across the top of this table, and those are things we have to address or, um, in our California program. And various other frameworks address very similar things. Uh, so the IC2 Alternative Assessment Guide, for example, addresses many of the same areas. Uh, some it doesn't address and some only partially. Um, and there are other things that, that don't really line up. But they're all informative um, in terms of, again, back to tools and processes uh, that people can use to uh, look at how we're going to do things here in California. It's even more complex than that, however, because when you look at any one of those factors that are required for consideration, there are multiple levels underneath it that are specifically required to be considered in our alternatives analysis process. And so I just highlighted on this slide that when we look at envi adverse environmental impacts, that under any one of these, say, uh, air uh, quality impacts, we have very specific things that you need to look at um, when you're doing an alternatives al analysis. Um, and so pretty quickly, when you look at a number of different factors uh, that we require consideration for, and you bore down, you get many, many factors that have to be considered both for the priority product and an, al and an alternative to that product. Now, that, the fact that all these things need to be considered doesn't mean that they're all relevant to your product and the chemical and to the alternative. And this is where, um, in the alternatives analysis process, you'll need to use, as a practitioner, um, your, your best judgment and, and tools that are available to um, decide what's relevant, as well as decide how to um, evaluate these factors. 
the bottom line is that what we hope is that, that the alternatives analysis will provide the framework for the responsible entity, as we call them, the manufacturer, um, to make good decisions about what they think they can do to make their products safer. And then they're going to use that analysis, give it to us at the Department of Toxic Substance Control, tell us the story, and then we're going to look at that when we evaluate, is there a regulatory response uh, that's necessary um, or not, and go from there. So I like to say that as complex as this process is, it's really going to be about telling your story and showing your work. Uh, with recognition that there are a lot of challenges uh, um, in many areas where there may be insufficient data, uh, there may be conflicting data, um, there may be a, a variety of alternative ways you, you can look at this process. Um, our regulations require that the alternative analysis process be done in two stages. The first stage is really um, uh, pr primarily a screening stage is to look at, you know, what's out there, the information that you have that's available. Um, can you quickly identify what are the relevant factors that you need to consider and what are some of the existing alternatives? Um, the one key thing I don't have on this slide is that uh, after the first stage um, that of, of the AA process, we will approve that um, report and it includes a work plan uh, for doing the second stage. So part of the concern I've heard many places about how do we know if we're on the right track or if what we're going to be doing is compliant. Um, what I would stress is that there's going to be a lot of um, options for those people doing alternatives analysis and they're not going to be done in a vacuum. So certainly at a minimum at the first stage we'll be consulting um, with the AA um, practitioner to say, does this make sense? Yes, we think you've, you've chosen wisely on relevant factors. And then you can move on to the second stage. And in the second stage, it's really more about doing more a detailed analysis and quantitative analysis, potentially uh, in considering economic impacts, and then coming up with your ultimate recommendation um, out of the process. Again, there in our regulations, there, there's a lot of information about the requirements and the time frames for this. I'm not going to go into great detail about uh, what those are. Um, but how are we going to get through this new process? How are we going to um, help people figure out how to do it and how we're going to measure it? Um, a couple of things. One, uh, we have reconstituted a, our Green Ribbon Science Panel, which uh, can is including uh, representatives, um, a lot of brilliant people from academia, industry and business, um, advocacy groups, health, environmental. Um, and we just recently um, had our first face-to-face -face meeting with the GRASP and what we've asked them to do is help us to um, develop guidance on how to do alternatives analysis in our framework. And they're looking at the good science and best practices and how to inform us uh, on how to help people get through the process. We're going to this summer be holding some workshops. We're going to be putting out uh, pieces of guidance that we will hope that we get a lot of input on um, from stakeholders so that we can develop by the end of the year a pretty good draft uh, guidance document that will help people um, identify tools, approaches, methodologies, methodologies um, that will support decision making um, and quote unquote showing your work as you go through the AA process. There's a lot going on. So um, at, at some point when you're done with the regulatory, uh, when you're done with the alternatives analysis and you submit it to the department, then it's incumbent on us to evaluate that. And then what? Well, we specifically, the legislature gave us um, seven areas where we can um, implement a regulatory response. First and foremost, um, we don't have to do anything. If the, if the AA is, is done well and uh, makes sense to us, then um, we'll, we'll say, that's great, move on. Um, if uh, there are needs there um, that we feel need to be addressed, then we have some options. And those might be everything from asking for additional information to fill some data gaps or to uh, improve our understanding. We may uh, require that a manufacturer provides information to a consumer that, that, that deals with potential um, risks that might be um, 
addressed in, in use of that product. We might ask for additional safety measures or, or controls in the product itself. And ultimately, we can um, restrict or even uh, ban the sale of that product in California if, if there's not a safer alternative and we don't feel that um, that's been addressed in the analysis. We also can require end-of-life uh, product stewardship if a product um, at its end of life, say it's going to be thrown in landfill, uh, needs to be um, diverted or um, come up with some end-of-life product stewardship uh, approach that could be required. And in, in some cases, we might say that, well, maybe there's not an alternative that we know. We need more information and we need some additional research or work to be done to move us forward. And we can also require that. So there's a broad palette of options there. Um, and a lot of it's going to depend on what's uh, included in the alternatives analysis. So where to from here? Um, to summarize a little bit, like some of the key things we're working on that will uh, inform us as we move forward and impact a lot of people as the three-year work plan. Um, I highlighted the, the priority products that we first identified. We're going to continue this process, and we're, we're one on one a lot of engagement as to uh, what we should consider in the future. Um, we're going to embark on rulemaking for to finalize our priority product uh, proposed uh, proposal so far, uh, and that'll take about a year. Um, and we're going to actively develop this alternative analysis guidance uh, that we hope will be a great tool for people and resource uh, for people to use. Um, I'd like to also note that um, we recognize that um, many companies that um, are, are typically large and, and are already doing some kind of alternatives analysis in the, the normal product development cycles of their product. Um, some of this may not be such a big reach. It may be about expanding your view um, and incorporating other factors that you did not incorporate in your existing business process. But for many medium and small size companies, this potentially could be something that they've not done um, and they're going to need assistance in and getting through the process. And so we anticipate that once the guidance gets out, that we'll be working with some of those companies directly and with trade organizations and others to uh, facilitate um, that process for folks. I also wanted to highlight that our regulations provide a process whereby um, any, any person can petition us to add or delete a chemical or product uh, into the system. Uh, for the first three years, we're, we didn't allow to uh, a petition to remove a chemical or priority product from the list. Um, that will come later, potentially. But it's uh, another uh, entry way for people to ask us to look at a specific chemical um, or priority product and, and say, should this be on the list or not? Um, and then we factor that into our priority products and AA process. Another important aspect of what we're doing heretofore mostly internal, has been developing a data management system that will support um, external stakeholders getting information from us and giving us information, both in terms of submitting data, submitting alternatives analysis uh, documents, uh, petitioning us, asking us questions, uh, all looking towards the web as the portal for that system. Uh, and an important part of that is our ability to uh, have a robust system that ensures the confidentiality uh, of confidential business information and trade secrets um, that are required to be submitted to us, but we're required to protect those. So um, we're excited about that, um, and hopefully that will be, make it easier to deal um, both with us in terms of getting questions answered, but also giving us information. Um, so how are we going to measure how what job we're doing? Well. You know, there's already a, a lot of signals going to the marketplace. When we um, came out with our informative list of the candidate chemicals, 1,100 plus chemicals, um, a lot of folks were looking at that. We've met with a lot of folks who are looking at that as an opportunity. They're saying, well, maybe um, we make a chemical that could be used uh, in a productive way uh, to replace some of these. So uh, those of you who maybe you already uh, subscribed to Floor Covering Weekly, but noted last fall that uh, soon after we came out with the list, you know, they had folks writing articles about um, within their industry and some of the, the products and materials they're using that there are safer alternatives that are available. Um, and so people are listening, looking, looking forward, and seeing how they can incorporate 
um, using green chemistry principles and, and everyone wants their product to be safe um, and they at the same time need to be competitive in the market. And that leads me to the other thing that we hope this will ultimately do, which will be stimulate uh, innovation. Um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of great things, both at, uh, on chemistry level and product level. We firmly believe that uh, we have the smartest uh, innovators and best businesses in the world that who, who want to make safer products. And uh, we're excited about that and hope that will continue. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's about protecting people in our environment, which we all uh, want to do. So this framework that we are implementing here in California is new. There's a lot of people doing some similar things. Um, but um, we're um, excited to be moving forward. We're uh, appreciative of your interest in learning what we're doing. We're going to rel be relying on people throughout the, the supply chain, if you will, businesses, industry, NGOs, um, health and environmental advocates, um, everyone communicating, giving us good information, uh, and hopefully getting us there. Um, if you want inf additional information, I really encourage you to go to our website, um, which is listed here. Uh, we have a, an email address that you can send us specific questions. Um, hopefully in the next month we'll be um, uh, putting up another, uh, this first part of our data management system which will allow comments and information to be more uh, readily uh, given to us. Um, so we want to hear from you because um, we're going to need um, everyone's help. Um, so if you want to get a hold of me, this is my contact information uh, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. So that's my whirlwind long and winding road tour, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Hi, everyone. This is Kim Richards with the National Pollution Prevention Roundtable, and I'll be facilitating the Q&A session. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Carl for such an informative presentation about this new program, and I'll go ahead and begin with the questions that we received during the webinar, but please continue submitting your questions in the GoToWebinar panel. Um, so the first question we have is, about when will the second product list be announced? As in, um, it seems that a draft priority products list will be announced for the next three years on October 1st, 2014. Um, so does this mean that whatever is announced are potentially final priority products for October 1st, 2014 through 2017? Um, okay, thanks, Kim. Yeah, the, the October 1st is the deadline for um, listing our three-year work plan. Um, and uh, I, I don't have a good a comprehensive slide that shows how these things overlap, but we will be initiating um, the rulemaking for our, our three products announced, hopefully this fall or the beginning of next year. That'll take about a year, and then that starts. And then in 2016, I think, would be when we would be considering the next set of uh, priority products. So there's going to be some overlap on this. Uh, it will be... Uh, certainly informed by our, as we move through the first set of products, what we learn on how that works or doesn't work and how we need to tweak it, um, and also limited somewhat by our capacity. Um, but we, we see this as the next one's coming um, soon thereafter, and then on and on. So um, the work plan, we, uh, we have a lot of latitude in that work plan, and we'll be asking people to give us some their perspective of what they think works as well. Okay, great. Uh, so moving on, the initial list has three products and three different chemicals. So will the second list of priority products focus on products using the three chemicals already identified, or will different chemicals be picked? Um, well, I suspect that we'll be, I mean, we'll certainly be looking at different products and probably, or potentially different chemicals. We're not really uh, bound by um, any hierarchy of, of what we pick other than the factors in the reg which are really focused on potential uh, exposures and potential uh, adverse impacts. But it, one interesting thing is if you look at the three products we put out there, they're very different um, and they raise different issues or have different aspects. So for example, uh, spray foam, uh, spray polyurethane foam is, a, is an interesting question in terms of Alternatives, are there viable alternatives in chemistries that can make uh, foam? Good question. That's very different from the flame retardant in the foam in children's products, which 
you know, it would seem to be that there are some uh, much easier alternatives. And um, I think you'll see uh, potentially that we'll be looking at things that have uh, an environmental or eco impact. Um, we have a lot of latitude, but we're not going to be just uh, restricting ourselves from the chemicals we already have. Um, it's pretty wide open. Great, thank you. Um, on to the next question. Many people see the requirements of doing an alternative assessment so resource and time consuming and extremely complicated without being able to obtain a reasonable outcome. Most believe the only choice will be to find substitution to a chemical of concern in a priority product. So how would you respond to that? Well, I think it, it really depends on the specific product um, and chemicals. And I think fundamentally, um, our framework is such is that we feel we're asking the people that know best about what their, the specs are for their product, for its performance, um, and how these products are made. And um, a lot of those questions people don't, may not know the answer to yet. Uh, certainly, as opposed to us, you know, with our perspective, setting a limitation or ban banning or restricting a substance or saying you should do it this way or that way, fundamentally we're asking that question, is it necessary? Is it viable? Um, are there better approaches? So we're not presuming that there's an answer. Um, we're asking the question. And I, it's important to note that we're not presuming that there's going to be a ban at the end. That people think this is, oh, this is the way to get to a ban. Not necessarily. If the alternatives analysis is done and done well, and we find that there is not a better alternative, then maybe we, you know, that informs us saying, well, we'll keep doing this the way we're doing it, but let's look down the road. But it is, I would acknowledge it, it is potentially a time consuming, complex, costly process. Um, and we're going to work with people on to try to make that efficient and effective. Great, thank you. Next question is. Would you agree that companies whose product is EPA designed for the environment will be ahead of regulation and not be impacted? Um, I think that I would say no, not necessarily. Um, if you, uh, let me circle back. Um, and can people still see my slides? Um, um, let me see here. Um, I think that the DFE program is a great program but it's not comprehensive in meeting all of our requirements. Um, so the slide uh, that I just put up, as you'll note, when you look at DFE, um, some of these categories uh, don't, aren't really addressed by their system. They're looking at chemical substitution primarily. Um, and so uh, our program is much more comprehensive. Certainly, um, it's, if you've gone through that process or you're looking at a similar process of DFE, it's very informative and it can be very helpful and maybe move you way down the road in doing your AA. But in and of itself, it won't meet all our requirements. Okay, great. Next question is, are you concerned that retailers may work with a product like baby sleep bumpers and decide to proactively phase out this but not do an alternative assessment and thus end up creating a moving target? Kim, could you read that one more time? Sorry. Um, are you concerned that retailers may work with a product like baby sleep bumpers and decide to proactively phase out this, but not do an alternatives assessment and thus end up creating a moving target? Um, I don't know. I think that, you know, certainly this is one of the reasons we want to hear from people in the workshops about the, the supply chains and the markets and impacts and whatnot. Um, the retailers, um, you know, it's an interesting time in retailers that some of the large retailers like Walmart and Target and others are already pushing upstream uh, in terms of their suppliers and, and, and both on chemicals and products that contain those chemicals. I don't, I don't think I'm, um, have enough knowledge to know what that might look like, but um, certainly I think retailers talking to their suppliers and manufacturers is a good thing. Um, and the other thing is that I think um, the market is very strong, and so consumer demand will be an issue as well. And I'm not sure how that all factors in. But that's not a very great answer, but it's a good question. Okay, thank you. Is the petition process available to get a product removed from the list prior to October 2014? 
Um, no, our petition process, um, as identified in our regulations, uh, essentially didn't allow removal of things for the first three years. Um, and I think in part the logic there is to, um, we're trying to get up and running. Uh, there may be things we want to consider adding before we take something off. Um, after then, it's, you can petition us either way. Okay. Um, now, one, let me yeah. add a note on that, Kim, is that, mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't mention this when I was talking about the candidate chemicals list. With the exception of two of those 23 lists, those lists um, are, are always changing, some faster than others. Um, the, the database that we put up was an informational database for people to look at that snapshot in time. We're going to continue to update that um, hopefully two or three times a year. But from a regulatory standpoint, um, those, your reg, the, what's on that list at any given point in time is one of the candidate chemicals. So I'll, let me use Prop 65 here in California as an example. Some things are, drop off that list. Once they drop off, they're no longer a candidate chemical and could not be considered. Some things are going to be added. Once they're added, they could be considered. We don't have to do a specific rulemaking to update those lists. They're, they're living lists, if you will. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, how does one go about correcting the misinformation provided in the DTSC's materials presented pertaining to our products? Well, there's several avenues of that. Um, you can contact us directly by sending the uh, uh, information to that email address or to me directly. You can come to our workshops. Um, we, we recognize that um, those documents had a lot of information in them and some data gaps as well. Uh, we want to get them right before we go to rulemaking, so we are happy to, to get people's input. We prefer it in writing so that we have a document we can you know, organize and make sure we fully address. But send them on in. Sorry, just really sorry. Uh, Kate, just, sorry, I just realized it? I was muted as I was reading that last question. Um, we do right. have another question. I apologize. <laughs> um, do you believe we'll ever get to the point where companies and designers will have to analyze the lifetime of the product, a somewhat cradle to grave type of analysis, to determine the safety of the product, including exposure to humans and the environment, the impact of the product at the wastewater treatment plants, uh, the landfill disposal, and so on? Well, I think that we're that that day is here, and in, in that the alternatives analysis criteria and requirements are extremely broad and require a life life cycle analysis thinking and a comprehensive look at many factors which um, have, have heretofore not been considered. Um, that's not to say that they're all relevant and that you have to go down deep on every one. Uh, it it has to be guided by your knowledge of your product, uh, and if you will the sort of conceptual model that you look at when you look at the lifespan of your product from extraction and manufacturing to production to transportation to the market to sales and ultimate use and ultimately end of life. So yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Will CBI get in the way of disclosing results of DTSC assessments or company alternatives assessments? Um, hopefully not. Uh, the provisions we identified to protect trade secrets are consistent with those already in California law. And um, essentially, if um, someone submitting an alternatives analysis wants to assert that, they can send us, you know, two copies of their work, one with what they believe should be redacted, and then us about um, their rationale for protecting the, that other information, and which we will do as appropriate. Um, you know, there are some who wish that everything was transparent, but there are certain um, boundaries there, and certainly we want to promote innovation uh, and protect people's uh, 
legitimate trade secrets that allow them to do business and, and make products. So there's a balance there, but I, uh, we're prepared to, to deal with that. Okay, thank you. Um, are all 1,000 candidate chemicals potential for next round of priority products, or is the focus on the identified about 153 chemicals? Oh, thank you. Good question. Y yes, um, the, those 153, the menu of 153 was only for the first round. So this next round, yes, the, the whole menu of 1,100 plus candidate chemicals um, is things that we could draw from. Okay, great. And I think this is the follow-up question to a previous question we had. Um, so the, it's about the petition process. So is this process not available to get chemicals off the draft list either? The petition process isn't available to, for removal right now. Right. Um, and the, you can petition us for chemicals, priority products, or list themselves. So, but you, we're, we're not taking anything off at this time. You can you can petition for us to add something right now. Okay, um, next question. Um, in the alternatives assessment, is there any attention given to the manufacturing process? For example, when comparing the hazards of two chemicals, the safer alternatives may require 10 times more water use, 10 times more energy, etc. in the manufacturing um, compared to the less safe alternative. Absolutely. Those are all important factors. And so that's why, again, a, a lot of the questions um, that, that are answered are, are going to be about trade-offs. Um, if we have a chemical that has um, a hazard characteristic that's less uh, potential for harm, that's a good thing. But if on the balance it, in five other categories it, um, you know, adversely affects uh, benthic organisms in water bodies or creates a huge greenhouse gas impact. Those are all things that need to be weighed and decisions made about their relevance and trade-offs. And that it's hard. This is part of the, the nature of this framework is not so narrow to just look at toxicity, for example, uh, or human toxicity, but pulling in these other things that are, that are sometimes trade-offs. So they're, if they're relevant, then yeah, those are things to consider in, in ultimately the, um, the recommendation for um, how to make your product safer. Okay, great. Um, and we're on to our last question before wrapping up. Um, is DTSC considering setting the minimal levels for COC in the next round of priority products? The standard in the law is the quantitation limit, and it is very difficult to interpret from a regulatory perspective. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, w well, first and foremost, we don't know what the next set of priority products might be yet. Um, I think as we go through the workshop and the, the work plan development, um, that we'll be looking for people to comment on that. Again, it's very product and chemical specific. Um, and you'll note that in our first three choices, we did not set uh, what we call an alternative analysis threshold. Um, so. Um, the standard in the reg applies is that it, um, it's the, the practical quantitation limit. So um, I think it's going to depend on what what chemicals and products we're looking at, and if appropriate, um, that would be another interesting and potentially challenging uh, process of identifying what would be an appropriate threshold. So we, but we don't have any at this time. Um, we haven't presupposed we're going to do it or not, and it's going to depend on the on the chemical and the product. Okay, great. Well, that so again, count. yep, again, that's the end of our um, webinar. Carl, did you have anything to wrap up with? Um, no, I would just say that, you know, a lot of good questions. Appreciate that. Please um, feel free to sign up for our list of serve on our webpage. Send in questions, send in information. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity for dialogue, and um, we uh, would appreciate that because uh, we want to do this uh, right. There's a lot of really good questions. It's a new process for us. So thank you for your uh, engagement. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks again, Carl, for a great presentation, and also to Donna for opening the webinar. Um, just a reminder that the recording and the slides will be available on our website at p2.org in the next week or so. Um, and again, on the screen, you can see some upcoming events for the Safer Chemistry Challenge Program. Um, that's it for today, so thanks, everyone.